All right, we have quite a beefy, I'll call it, but uh, a really fun Bible study ahead of us this morning. This is one of those Bible studies where I'm going to go out on a limb at the very beginning and make a really bold claim and say that if you will track with me, and I don't mean that diminutively, I just mean that it, I may go a little bit longer than I usually do, just given the breadth of the stuff that we're going to talk about. But if you hang in there towards the end, I believe you're going to have some clarity, some answers that may help our Old Testament make a lot of sense. How many times have you ever heard somebody say, either to you directly, or maybe you've seen it in a debate, somebody says something like this, why was God so cruel in the Old Testament? Why did God tell his people to kill off the people in the promised land. By the end of this Bible study, I believe we're going to be equipped uh, with a satisfactory answer to that question. Now, I'm going to start with something a little abstract and say, I want to encourage you guys to read your Bible like a novel. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. We all understand that the Bible is more than a novel. Uh, the Bible is history. The Bible is poetry. The Bible is prophecy. The Bible is a collection of books. It's a library. But what I'm saying is when we read a novel, we do so knowing that the author has written it with intentionality. There's design and purpose to it so that we know chapter two is going to build off of chapter one. When we get to chapter 10, the things we read in chapter five suddenly start to make a lot more sense. My observation is a lot of times we'll pick up our Bibles and we'll just read a random chapter from over here. And then tomorrow, most of the time, because our devotional guide tells us to, we'll go to another random chapter from another part of the Bible. The problem is when we read our Bibles that way, we miss out on the intentionality of it and the structure of it. Nothing is building off of anything that came before it. We would never read a novel that way. We would never pick up a novel and turn to chapter 32 and read that chapter. And then tomorrow, read chapter 11. And then the next day, read chapter 81. God, like any good author, has written the Bible with tremendous purpose. There is a wonderful connectivity that runs through the entire Bible. And I think you're going to see a few instances this morning where if we will read the Bible like the one continuous, purposeful account that it is, it'll all start to make sense. We're talking this morning about the Nephilim. Uh, now, some people around the room are already thinking, I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, and the other people in the room are thinking, I can't believe you're going to talk about this. But it's right here in our text. And so to me, to not talk about it would be unfaithful to the word of God. I'm going to go ahead and mention there's a couple of strong resources that I'm going to cite regularly through this Bible study this morning. One is the thesis that was put out by Tim Chafee, The Sons of God and the Nephilim. The other, which is also from Tim Chafee, is his book, Fallen. And for those who are interested, Tim holds an MA in Biblical and Theological, Theological Studies, a Master in Divinity, specializing in apologetics and theology. He's the founder of Midwest Apologetics. He works for Answers in Genesis and the Ark Encounter, and he's just done a lot of really good research into this topic. And so to sort of reset the compass, last week we essentially closed the gap between Adam and Noah, and we saw that this was a time of rapid technological advancement. There was a massive population explosion taking place, but it was also a time of tremendous man-centeredness. Well, this morning as we come to chapter 6, things don't get any better. Um, in fact, they get worse. So let's read in verse 1 <clears throat> Excuse me, of chapter 6. It came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God, verse 2, saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful. And they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, verse 3, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. From this point, God's got a clock ticking. Verse 4 says, there were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward. Interesting. When the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Then the Lord said, saw, verse 5, excuse me, 
that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's a profound statement. Verse 6, the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But verse 8 says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These verses describe an occasion when the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful. And as a result, these sons of God took for themselves wives of human women, of all whom they chose. And whatever is happening in this passage, it is so bad that it prompts God to essentially wipe mankind off the face of the planet and start all over again with Noah. Now, to add to the mystery of the text, verse 4 says, there were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when these sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. Now, the original word for giant in this verse is Nephilim. In the Hebrew Bible, it says, the Nephilim were in the earth in those days, and also after that, whenever the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bore children to them. Tim Chafee writes, the term Nephilim is in all likelihood not a Hebrew word, it is a plural form of the Aramaic noun, nafil, which means giant. This is stated in the major Hebrew and Aramaic lexicons. In fact, the majority of ancient biblical translations, the Septuagint, the Theodosian, the Latin Vulgate, the Targum, they all use the word Nephilim for giants. Now, we're going to come back to verse 4 because the word when in this verse is extremely important in our understanding of what's happening in this passage. But again, Tim Chafee writes, when properly understood, Genesis 6 verse 4 makes it clear that the Nephilim, the giants, were the offspring of the sons of God and the daughters of men. Now, I should let you know, before we get into this, I am not going to spend our time this morning looking at the supposed archaeological evidence from around the world for the historical existence of giants, because there's a lot of it. Neither am I going to focus on the more fantastical claims of the existence of giants, like the Kandahar giant in Afghanistan in 2002, or the fact that there's supposedly giants living in the Solomon Islands or the American Midwest. Those things are fun, but they're speculative, right? You'd think in the day of cell phones and drone footage that we live in, if somebody were to come across a modern-day giant, we would get some compelling footage of it. Uh, there's also giant myths from around the world, and just about every culture we see this. But again, I agree with Tim Chafee on this. We believe in giants because the Bible says there were giants. Now, there's three traditional views to what's going on in Genesis chapter 6. And all three views agree that something bad is taking place here, which again results in God pronouncing judgment on the entire planet. The first view is what's known as the royalty view. So they look at the expression in verse 4 about the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. And they'll say that the sons of God were kings, or nobles who considered themselves divine, who forced common women, the daughters of men, to join their harems, and thus their major sin was that of polygamy. Now, this view did not develop until around the late 1st or early 2nd century AD, and it doesn't account for the unusualness of their offspring, the Nephilim. Neither does it account for the severity of God's judgment, but it's one view. The second view, which is a little bit more popular, is sometimes called the Sethite view. At the end of chapter 4, we read this verse, to Seth was born a son, and he named him Enosh, and men began to call on the name of the Lord. So the Sethite view equates the line of Seth calling on the name of the Lord with the sons of God mentioned in chapter 6. And they say that what's being described in this passage is essentially the godly line of Seth. We might say believers 
are intermarrying with the ungodly line of Cain. We might say unbelievers. Now, <clears throat> again, it's worth noting, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm like a lot of people struggling with allergies. This was the last view to be developed. It didn't come onto the scene until about the third or fourth century. And it was largely popularized by Augustine. But there's a couple of problems with this viewpoint. For one, there's a fairly major textual problem. You have to change the meaning of the word men several times throughout the passage. So for instance, verse one says, it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them. Okay, in that verse, everyone would most likely agree that the term men and daughters refers to all men on the planet. But this view suggests that in the very next verse, when we read about the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that suddenly the daughters of men only refers to the ungodly line of Cain. Then in verse 3, when God says, my spirit shall not strive with man forever. Well, that's a reference to all of humanity. But then in verse 4, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, now we're back to that term only referring to the ungodly line of Cain. Tim Chafee writes, within this view, believers marrying unbelievers led to God judging the world with the flood. While we certainly don't diminish the problem of a believer marrying an unbeliever, it does seem extreme to think that this provides an adequate backdrop for the most devastating judgment the world has ever seen, particularly when believers continue to marry unbelievers throughout history without humanity ever suffering a worldwide judgment. He writes, the Sethite view is practically self-defeating. If these Sethite men were so godly, why do they continue to marry unbelieving women? Which is a really good point. Also, the Sethite view does not take into account the existence of the Nephilim. David Guzik writes, why was there something unusual about their offspring? The idea that these were believers marrying unbelievers doesn't seem to fit the record of the text. It also doesn't explain the existence of the Nephilim after the flood. You say, Kevin, what are you talking about? Well, this is not the only Bible passage where we read about the Nephilim. In Numbers chapter 13, when Moses sent 12 spies into the promised land, 10 of them, you'll remember, brought back a negative report. And here's what they said. The land through which we have gone is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw are men of great stature. There we saw the giants. The word giants, it's Nephilim. Now, somebody might say, well, Kevin, if the flood was supposed to wipe the Nephilim out, how could there be Nephilim in the promised land hundreds of years later? Which is a really good question. Remember how I mentioned the word when in verse 4 is really important to how we understand this passage? Depending on how we read that impacts the meaning of this passage greatly. If I read it this way, there were giants on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. That makes it sound like the unholy union of the sons of God and the daughters of men happened at a time when the Nephilim were on the earth. But the Hebrew Bible actually, actually reads, the Nephilim were in the earth in those days and also after that, whenever the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men. In fact, this is one of very few instances where I actually like the New Living Translation. It says, in those days and for some time after, giant Nephilites lived on the earth, for whenever the sons of God had intercourse with women, they gave birth to children who became the heroes and famous warriors of ancient times. By the way, on a side note, it is interesting how many cultures include tales of gods having relations with human women and producing superhuman offspring. So, for instance, you think about Zeus, who had you know, relations with a woman and produced Hercules. In fact, Zeus, Zeus was a bad dude. I mean, <clears throat> when you, if you read Greek mythology... He ran around all over the place, and, and through the coupling of a human female named Leto, he produced Artemis and Apollo. <clears throat> <clears throat> throat> 
Satan's attacking my voice because he doesn't want me to get this Bible study out this morning. Or it could be pollen. Um, Poseidon, the god of the sea, had relations with human women. In the epic Gilgamesh, the character of Enkidu is considered to have been of a divine essence. You, you see this in Norse mythology. You see this in Sumerian mythology. You see this in Babylonian mythology. You think of the Apkalu, the Anunnaki. These are all echoes of what happened in the book of Genesis. Critics say, oh, well, the Bible just borrowed those ideas and incorporated them into Scripture. And I would say the exact opposite is what happened. At the Tower of Babel, when mankind is scattered across the face of the planet, he takes with him all these familiar concepts which are rooted in actual history, and he writes them into local legends and myths. In fact, Josephus, who was not a Christian, he was a Jewish historian, he wrote that the sons of God actually did what resembled the actions of those the Greeks called giants. But coming back to the Bible, why is it significant that we read of the Nephilim in the book of Numbers? Well, who wrote the book of Numbers? Moses wrote the book of Numbers, right? So if the spies came back and brought a negative report, and they were just scared, and they're exaggerating, and they say, the Nephilim are there, but they really weren't there, I don't think Moses would have written that down in the scripture. And I also think it's interesting that neither Joshua nor Caleb refuted their claims. But also, who's compiling the book of Genesis? Moses, right. So if Moses is compiling Genesis around the same time he's writing numbers, then it makes sense for him to say, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days, Genesis, and also afterward, Numbers, whenever the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and bore them children. See, that's reading the Bible like a novel. So this brings us to the third view of this passage, the fallen angel view, that the sons of God having relations with daughters of men is a reference to fallen angels having intimate relations with human women, which produced, I guess we might say, a mutant race of half-human, half-angelic beings that were the giants of ancient times. Now, if you're still with me, uh, the exact phrase for sons of God in Hebrew is Beneha Elohim. In all the other Old Testament places that it is used, it's clearly referring to angels. Okay, so Job 1.6 says, There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came among them. Job 2 says, There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan come, came among them. Job 38, when, when God questions Job, he says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth when all the sons of God shouted for joy? Here's another one from the ESV. This is Deuteronomy 32. Moses is recounting for Israel their history. He says, remember the days of old when the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance when he divided mankind. Well, when was that? That was at the Tower of Babel. But keep reading, he says, when he fixed the borders of the people according to the number of the sons of God. Now that's interesting. Something's going on there. So you remember in Daniel chapter 10 when we read about the prince of Persia, the prince of Greece, that idea of territorial spirits? Okay, when did that happen? When were they given dominionship? over geographical regions? When were they made principalities? That happened at Babel. Okay, so make a note. In a few weeks' time, we're going to talk about the divine council and having a Deuteronomy 32 worldview. Say, Kevin, what does that mean? You've got to come back in a few weeks' time because that's when we're going to do that Bible study, sort of a preview of upcoming attractions. But coming back to this morning's Bible study, these are all clear references to angelic beings. In fact, in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, the translators interpret in Genesis 6 
the phrase sons of God as angels. Early translators did not believe the sons of God were descendants of Seth or kings of old. But the question becomes, why? Why would Satan do this? Okay, this is where context becomes extremely important. This is why every week I will say to you guys, make sure you go back and listen to our previous studies in this series because a few weeks ago we talked about the Proto-Evangelium, the first mention of the gospel in the entire Bible. In Genesis chapter 3, God is pronouncing a curse upon the serpent, and he says to him, because you have done this, because he had tempted the man and the woman, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now, we don't have time to go over all this again this morning, but notice the masculine singular Hebrew pronoun for the seed of the woman. In Romans 16.20, the he is called the God of peace, clearly identifying it with Jesus Christ. So you're Satan, right? I like saying that in counseling sessions. You're Satan. No, um, so you're Satan, right? You're a limited being. You don't have all knowledge. Uh, this, this is something We sometimes think that Satan is the, the dark equal to God. Satan can only be in one place at one time. He can't read your mind. He, he doesn't know everything that God's going to do. So he's a limited being, and all he has to work off of is this pronouncement that God just made, that he's going to destroy him through a human being being born. And what many Bible scholars, ancient and contemporary, believe is that Genesis chapter 6 is essentially Satan attempting to pollute the entire human gene pool because if he can do that, the Messiah can't be born. David Guzik writes, we can deduce why Satan sent his angels to intermarry with human women. Satan tried to pollute the genetic pool of mankind with a satanic corruption to put something like a genetic virus to make the human race unfit for bringing forth the seed of the woman. James Montgomery Boyce said, if Satan could succeed in infecting the entire human race, the promised deliverer could not come. In fact, if you let your eyes keep reading down into verse 9, we read about the genealogy of Noah. It says, Noah was a just man, perfect in his generation. Now, the idea there isn't that Noah had a perfect family. Again, David Guzik writes, this description of Noah refers to the fact that he was yet uncorrupted by Satan's attempt to sow something like a virus among the genetic pool of mankind. We could translate the phrase perfect in his generations as Noah was pure in his genetic profile. Now, clearly, Satan was somewhat successful in his attempt. This is what produced the mutant race of the Nephilim and what provoked God to ultimately destroy all of mankind and start over with one God who was pure in his genetic profile. As soon as Noah and his family comes off the ark, what happens? God repeats to Noah and his family what we call the Edenic mandate. He tells them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. God is essentially starting all over again. That's reading the Bible like a novel. Now, do we have evidence that this is what's going on? Well, Jude and Peter both write about this in passages that are very similar to one another. Jude speaks of the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, who went after, or who gave themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh. Peter writes of the angels who sinned, the spirits who are in prison, who were disobedient in the days of Noah. Those passages make some kind of reference to something that happened sometime in history where angels sinned and committed sexual immorality at the time of Noah. In fact, I would say that if that isn't what those passages are referring to, what are they referring to? 
Again, Tim Chapey writes, these three New Testament passages refer to angels who sinned during the days of Noah. If Genesis 6 is speaking of fallen angels, then these three passages make perfect sense. However, if the sons of God of Genesis 6 refer to certain groups of men, then we really have no idea what these passages in the New Testament are all about. But Jude and Peter and Moses, they all wrote about this stuff like their readers would have known what they were talking about. This is another way to think of contextualization. Okay, contextualization isn't just, well, read this chapter after that chapter. When we read the Bible, whether we mean to or not, we have a tendency to apply certain filters. So, for instance, if you were to belong to a certain denomination, you may apply a denominational filter. Here in America, and this is probably true of every culture, we'll, we'll apply an American filter. And there are many people who read Scripture through a modern political filter, but contextualization truly is to read the Bible through the lens and the culture and the worldview and the history of the people who were writing it. You know why Moses didn't take time to explain who the Nephilim were? Because everybody in his day would have known who the Nephilim were. We, we read this and we think, oh, I wish Moses would have explained this better. Understand, Moses didn't know he was writing something that we were going to be sitting here studying 8,000 years later, right? If I were to send out a group text to a bunch of people in our church, and I said, meet me at 7-Eleven, you realize that in that group text, I would not discuss the history of 7-Eleven, I would not discuss where the name 7-Eleven came from, because all of my recipients would be familiar with what a 7-Eleven is. This is why this line of Moses, like when you read it, it almost sounds like a throwaway line. The Nephilim were in the earth in those days and also after that, whenever the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men. Ancient Hebrews would have been like, yep, Nephilim, got it. When Jude and Peter write about this, did you notice? They don't explain about these angels who sinned. They don't really go into the, the history or the theology of it. It's because they knew their readers would have been like, oh yeah, I remember hearing about when that happened in history. That's reading the Bible like a novel. In fact, this fallen angel view was the most widely accepted and earliest view of both Jewish and Christian writers. This is a chart of many, not all, but many of Christian and Jewish writers and historians who subscribe to this viewpoint. One article writes, all early sources refer to the sons of God in Genesis 6 as angels. From the 3rd century BC onwards, references are found in Enochic literature, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Book of Jubilees, Josephus, Justin Martyr, Eusebius, Clement, Origen, all believe that the sons of God in Genesis 6 were fallen angels who engaged in unnatural union with human women, resulting in the beginning of the Nephilim, or the giants. Now, I'm sure I'll get criticized for this, um, but that's okay. kind of comes with the territory. Um, but in the book of Enoch, which, by the way, uh, Jude quotes from, and we recognize this is not inspired scripture, but it is an intertestamental text that says, it came to pass that the children of men multiplied and were born unto them, beautiful and comely daughters. And the angels, the children of heaven, saw and lusted after them and said to one another, come, let us choose wives from among the children of men and beget children. They took unto themselves wives and they began to go unto them and defile themselves with them. And they became pregnant and they bore great giants and there arose much godlessness and they committed fornication and they were led astray and became corrupt in all their ways. Tim Chapey writes, this view absolutely dominated Jewish writings on the topic until the early 2nd century AD and Christian writings until the 5th century AD. He writes, God judged the earth with a worldwide flood because of the extreme wickedness. While all three views agree on this point, only the fallen angel view truly makes sense since the other two sins have occurred countless times throughout history. Believers have married unbelievers. 
noble men have married common women. Why hasn't God brought such a harsh judgment for these actions? What took place in Genesis 6 seems to have been quite unique, so the fallen angel view makes better sense of this issue as well. Now, somebody might think, well, Kevin, you mentioned that there were Nephilim after the flood. If they were wiped out, how did that happen? Well, remember, between the time that Noah comes off the ark, there's about a 400-year gap before God finds a guy named Abraham and makes to him this promise that in his seed, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. Okay, here we go. From that moment on, Satan now has more information. It's not just the seed of the woman anymore. Now it's the seed of Abraham. And the entire Old Testament becomes about God working to preserve the lineage of the Hebrew people. But before that, during those 400 years, clearly another group of fallen angels attempted to corrupt the human gene pool again. Remember, Moses wrote, the Nephilim were in the earth in those days and also after that, whenever the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men. And there are several clans, we might say, of giants that we read about in the Bible. When you're reading through the Old Testament, if you come across terms like Rephaim, or Emim, or Zuzim, or Anakim, or the Amorites, those are all references to giants. There's some giants mentioned by name in the Bible. Of course, we're all familiar with Goliath, but Og, king of Bashan, is believed to have been quite a bit bigger than Goliath. David's mighty men killed giants named Ishbi Benob, Saph, Lami, as well as an unnamed giant with six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot. But this, this is where this starts to get really interesting. Here's a map of where all those clans of giants are located around the promised land. Okay, so again, you're Satan. Follow me on this. You're a limited being. And all you can work from is whatever God has revealed. And up till now, you've been working off the prophecy that the Messiah is going to come through the seed of the woman. But as of Genesis chapter 22, now you know it's going to be through the seed of Abraham. And, I'm paraphrasing, but God tells Abraham, the promise is going to be to your seed, and I'm going to bring you back to this land. And they're in Hebron when God makes that promise. And when you look at where these clans of giants are located, they are all strategically placed around the land of Hebron where God had promised he was going to bring back Abraham's seed and through whom the Messiah is going to be born. So why do you think God tells them when they go into the promised land to kill off all the surrounding people groups and not marry them. That isn't just God being cruel. By the way, to clear something up, the conquest under Joshua was not an indiscriminate slaughter of every man, woman, and child. In fact, if you read the Bible, you will see this very clearly. It was a targeted assault on the places where the giants were known to live. Understanding these important historical details provides the basis to adequately address the skeptics' repeated charges of God being cruel. This is God working to preserve the seed of Abraham from being corrupted the same way it had been attempted to corrupt the seed of the woman prior to the flood. See, the fallen angel view is the only view of Genesis chapter 6 that explains not only the severity of the flood, but also explains the severity of the conquest of the land when they came into the promised land. God tells them to kill off the surrounding people groups and not marry with them. Because if there were giants and their races or their clans had been corrupted, then it would have corrupted the seed 
of Abraham. That's reading the Bible, Bible like a novel. Now, I want to close by reading a summarized account, uh, or a summarized quote, I should say, from Tim Chafee. Uh, we do not have time this morning to go into a biblical defense of the fallen angel view. I would say if you're interested in that, this is where that handout I mentioned earlier will come in handy. Tim does a really good job of sort of answering the common arguments that people bring up about this. And this is also going to become the topic of our Wednesday deeper discussion. So if you're interested in that, I encourage you to join us. Tim Chafee summarizes this last point beautifully. He says, the city of Hebron is of special interest in this study. The book of Joshua states five times that Hebron was formerly Kerjeth Arba, which means the city of Arba. Joshua reveals that Arba was the father of Anak, who was the father of the Anakim. According to Numbers 13.33, the Anakim were part of the Nephilim. This becomes even more interesting when one considers that Hebron was where Abraham lived and built an altar to the Lord where Sarah died and was buried, where Isaac lived, where Jacob and his sons lived prior to Egypt, and where Jacob was buried. Satan could have known that God had promised the land to Abraham's descendants and that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob all lived there. In fact, it was the last place the sons of Israel lived before going to Egypt and the place in which they buried their dead. Therefore, the most natural place for the devil to guard in his efforts to prevent this particular promise from being fulfilled would be the city of Hebron. This is exactly where Arba, the father of Anak, lived. By the time of the conquest, Anak's descendants also lived in the city. Was this part of Satan's futile attempt to stop God from keeping his promises, or is this all just one big coincidence? Given that the sons of Anak are part of the Nephilim, could Anak's father, Arba, actually have been a son of a fallen angel? Could he himself have been a fallen angel who became the progenitor of the post-flood Nephilim? Since the Bible does not reveal this information, one can only speculate. Man may never be able to solve this puzzle with certainty, but the pieces fit together in an extremely intriguing manner. And I would agree with that. So, when you come back next week, we're going to move into the flood of Noah. So I would encourage you this week to read chapter 6 through 9. So this morning, we really only covered a few verses. Next week, we're covering quite a bit. Um, now, somebody is probably thinking, Kevin, what does this have to do with my life today? <laughs> a, I would say it helps you understand what your Bible is about. B, let me ask you a question, and this isn't, I'm not, this is not question and answer time. Um, what's dominating our headlines right now? It's an aerial strike from Iran against Israel. Okay, follow me on this. What's the whole point of this morning's Bible study been? It's been looking at Satan's attempts to stop God from being able to fulfill his promises. <clears throat> what has God promised in the Bible? When Jesus comes back, where is it going to be, and where is Jesus going to reign and rule from? It's going to be Israel. He's going to reign and rule from Jerusalem. Do you understand that the movement that is on in the world today to destroy Israel is because if Israel can be destroyed, God can't fulfill his promises. It's the exact same thing. If you want to know what this has to do with today, our enemy is hard at work the way he's been from the very beginning trying to thwart God from being able to accomplish his purposes. And yet God is hard at work. Actually, I wouldn't even say he's hard at work. You know, like He's just doing it, man. He's going to fulfill his promises. We sometimes get freaked out. Remember, I mean, this is what I love about the account when the spies go into the land. You know, 10 of them come back and they're freaked out. They're like, there's giants there. The Nephilim are there. And Joshua and Caleb are like, so? <laughs> we'll eat them, you know? I mean, they're like, we can take them. But what does it say of Joshua and Caleb? They had a different spirit in them. Amen. Okay, church, we're not called like the rest of the world to freak out at what we see happening in the world. We have a different spirit in us. Yeah. And the reason we study this stuff is so we can say, let me tell you exactly what is happening. 
Let me tell you how this is going to play out. God's going to fulfill his promises, and Jesus is going to come back and set up his kingdom and reign and rule for a thousand years in perfect righteousness. And right now, we have the opportunity to be part of that great plan. And so that's our mission, to go out and tell people that good news.